Well, this morning we want to consider the account of Mephibosheth. That's perhaps a name that you don't hear very often, Mephibosheth, and how he was called by David to, uh, from Lodabar to Jerusalem and was shown amazing kindness. So the title, perhaps, if you want one for the message, would be A Discovery of Amazing Kindness. It's a discovery that Mephibosheth himself experienced, and it's a discovery that I hope each one of us either has experienced or will experience as we consider the parallels, the comparisons between Mephibosheth and the sinner coming to the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour. So we see David showing amazing kindness. Here was David, he has amazing kindness. There was Mephibosheth in a faraway land, out of sight, perhaps an isle of mind. And David says, you know Saul, my enemy, uh, the one who persecuted me, who, who, who chased me, who made me a, a fugitive on the run for several years, who sought my life with great power and great, great hatred. Does he have any grandchildren? Does he have any children? Is there anybody of his household that I most show great kindness to? Of course, we know that he showed great kindness because of also Jonathan, whom was his best friend. Jonathan, whom loved him and he loved as, as his own self, the Bible tells us. This great bond of great friendship. But still, Mephibosheth might be like his grandfather. Mephibosheth might be a, a one who hates David, an enemy of David. And he's thinking, there he is, perhaps far away, this, this, this unknown relative of Saul, any relative of Saul, you know, somebody whom David could show his love upon. And what is that relative going to be like? Are they going to be like Saul? Perhaps brooding away somewhere, thinking, well, Israel is currently sitting in the hands of David. And Ishbosheth, who was uh, one of Saul's uh, sons, his rebellion against David has failed. Well, maybe I should have a go now. That's all that David possibly could have thought about. Saul had shown him no kindness, and Ishbosheth had shown him no kindness, and yet David is still saying, Is there somebody that I can show kindness to? Somebody of that household that I can show kindness to. Somebody who uh, might consider me an enemy, whom I can show great kindness to. Well, he calls one of the servants of Saul, Ziba by name. And uh, Ziba, an appearance of good character, an appearance of being submissive. Oh, yes, Lord, yes, I'll, I'll come and... Uh, tell you about these, this man, Mephibosheth, and I'll tell you about the fact that he's lame in his feet. And I'll tell you about him. Well, unfortunately, Ziba didn't prove to be as genuine as he appears in this passage, but we'll consider that, in fact, this evening. It's a little bit of a taste for you, perhaps, for this evening. But anyway, Ziba tells David of Mephibosheth, a man lame in his feet. And David said, get him, send for him. Bring him to me, this son of Jonathan, whom I loved as myself. I want to show him great kindness. I want to show him great compassion. I want to bring him into my household. So there's this great kindness. And Mephibosheth, you know, David isn't doing so because Mephibosheth has anything to offer. Uh, you know, has anybody left of, day, of Saul's house? Oh yes, Mephibosheth. By the way, he's lame in his feet. He's not going to be any use to you in service. Still send for him. Still bring him to me. He might not be able to go working the ground. He might not be, able, be much use to me. And in fact, usually in king's houses at this time and around their tables, if you had, uh, if you had some kind of deformity, you wouldn't be allowed in. You want perfection, you want beauty around the king. And, and the fact that his, his feet are lame, probably crippled because of uh, what happened to him, how he lost that, then, well, that's going to be a, a, a spot in a, per, in a perfect setting, isn't it? Well, it was contrary to the norm then, what David did. It was contrary to uh, what we see in other places in the Bible. Um, another rebellion... Uh, was um, led 
and uh, well, everybody was wiped out. All the family of the, uh, of, of the previous king was wiped out. So nobody could say that they had a claim to the throne. Well, that was usual. That was usual in David's time. In fact, with that very thought in mind, Mephibosheth's maid, when he was still just young, had taken Mephibosheth up in her arms and fled when she heard that Saul and Jonathan had been slain in, slain in battle. And she dropped him and he became lame in his feet. That's how that happened. But David was going to be different. Perhaps then we see an example of how we should treat others, even those who have wronged us. Uh, we have various instructions on the way that we should behave uh, to those around us and how we should treat those around us. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 and uh, verse 43 to 44. Matthew chapter 5 verse uh, verse, I'm going to up. Matthew chapter uh, 5, uh, verse 43 to 44. It says this. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Or again, we have Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and at the end there, from verse 17, Repay no one evil for evil, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. We don't do those good things, by the way, so that, 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 that they do have coals of fire, fire heaped on their heads in the sense of, oh, wow, this is amazing that he's shown me such great kindness, although I've so spitefully done this to him. We hope that that experience might bring uh, the person to, to think, well, there's something different about this individual. Although I treated them as an enemy, although I hated them and spitefully used them, they're treating me with such great kindness. And in the history of the church, um, there are accounts of individuals who have seen the uh, love of others shown to them when they haven't shown love to that individual and they've been touched and they've, they've come to realise there is something different about them and they've been saved. Well, this, but it wasn't so that they would feel bad that David did this good thing or we shouldn't do good things so that others will feel bad, that they haven't behaved in such a way, but rather so that uh, rather we should do it with uh, sincerity. And David showed great sincerity in the way that he sent for Mephibosheth. He sent this great, on, he would have sent an entourage with, a, with an invitation on a, on a pillow perhaps, as we might imagine today. Here's the invitation from David, uh, the great summons, King David requests your company. King David wants you to come and be with him, Mephibosheth. Look, he's, he sent for you at his own expense. He sent you um, this uh, entourage, he sent for you this, this chariot to take you because he's heard that you are lame in your feet and so the journey is going to be tough for you. And then David, once he shows great kindness to Mephibosheth, doesn't simply keep him in some, as some kind of servant. No, he restores to Mephibosheth the land that his grandfather Saul had owned. He returns, returns it all to him, he restores it to him, and he gives him servants to care for that land. Ziba and his servants and Ziba's sons as well. So there's David's sincerity. 
this, this entourage sent, this, this expense, this cost to David himself to call Mephibosheth to himself and then he gives him the land and he gives him these servants. Well, Mephibosheth therefore came to know that David did indeed care for him. And later on, when David was forced out of his position of authority by his own son Absalom, Mephibosheth laments. He laments. He says, this David whom I so cared for, he's, he's driven away from me. He's a fugitive again, on the run this time from his own son Absalom. And he took me as a son. May I not treat David as David's actual son treated David. That's what Mephibosheth thought. That's what Mephibosheth would have said. So do we show such great love and kindness as David did? Do we show this Christian love, it's commonly called? This is this, this giving, this, this caring. You know, that's all good. There are individuals all across the globe made in God's image. They've had every single human being is made in the image of God. They all have worth. They all have dignity. They should all be shown respect and care. They should be shown great kindness. We should have great compassion for them. Indeed, God has already shown great kindness and compassion. And although we might not be able to show such an extent of kindness as David was able to show, we don't have lands to give back, we don't have such great riches to give back, there are things that we can do and things that we can care, we, we can do in showing that we care. We should imitate David as David imitates Christ. As Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But although we could go on and talk about the kindness that we should show to others, the great compassion we should show to others, this isn't the full height of the passage. Yes, the passage could teach us some moral lesson. Do good to those around you. You know, care for them. But there's got to be something more going on in this passage. There's got to be some spiritual application. And there is. And perhaps after a little bit of digging, you'll soon be able to see it quite easily. There was Mephibosheth. House of Saul. Supposed enemy of David. David, one of a man after God's own heart, he's called. You could say that he was of the house of God, of the house of Christ even. Now that brings to mind Romans chapter 5, where we're told that there are again two households, or rather two kingdoms, two lineages. Adam's or Christ's? Are we in Adam or are we in Christ? Are we enemies of God or are we sons and daughters of God? Saul is therefore, a represent, uh, sim, is full, Saul is therefore similar to Adam in many ways. Uh, Saul's fall is similar to Adam's fall. Adam had the word of God. Adam didn't trust the word of God. Adam did his own thing. Adam was separated from God, thrown out of the garden, and lost the blessings for all of his descendants, all his posterity. Saul had the word of God. Don't go to battle until Samuel comes to you and prays for you and offers a sacrifice. He didn't listen to the word of God. He went his own way and offered a sacrifice, which was contrary to God's word anyway. He then was separated from God's presence, not even considered one of the prophets of God anymore. He lost the kingdom, he lost the land, he lost it for not just for himself, but for all his descendants, all his posterity. So we have then the lost estate, not given to the posterity, but in rather, inherit, uh, rather inherited by somebody else. Well, that's going to be returned. That's going to be restored. And the only way that the son of Adam, the only way that somebody who is descended from Adam, so that's everyone, can have their communion with God returned and their restoration of that Garden of Eden in picture given back to them is through God, through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The estate might be lost to us now. The peace may be lost to us now. The communion with God may be lost to us now, but it can be given back, but only through coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, coming to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Mephibosheth was, a nat as a natural man, was, had enmity against David, and we as natural individuals have enmity against God. And yet, remarkably, Mephibosheth is called to sit at David's table, and we are called to sit at God's table. What great grace is shown to us. What great loving kindness. And so we want to expound this a little bit more. We want to come to these ten parallels, these ten comparisons. And the first is this, an enemy. We've already expounded that a little bit, haven't we? There was Mephibosheth, the household of Saul. Or similarly, we are the household of Adam. We are an enemy of God. And there are three ways they were enemy of God. It's interesting, Mephibosheth was somebody who probably didn't even want to think much about David, wasn't sure what David thought about him, and would rather keep his distance. Well, there's three ways that we are an enemy of God, and you'll recognise perhaps one of those as parallel. The first is those who are aggressive. That was Saul, wasn't it? That was Saul. He was the one who was aggressive against uh, David. And those who are aggressive against God can easily say, oh, well, they, they obviously hate God. They're obviously one of God's enemies. But then there are those who are apathetic. They don't care. They don't think about God much. They try to keep, they just try to forget about him, keep their distance, not have much to do with him. But in so doing, they are showing themselves to be enemies of God because they're basically saying, when Christ came into this world and suffered what he did and went to the cross, it means nothing to me. I don't care about that. What a, what a great unthankfulness and a great sense, that was a great loss. So there they are basically despising Christ's own blood, which could be shed for them. So we have aggression, we have apathy, and we have invalidation. Those who think that they are saved, think that they're not enemies of God. Well, I don't hate God. I, I, I go to church, I, I, I read his word, I, you know, I do this, that, and the other. Well, none of those things are going to save them. Not being, it's not by being good enough. Well, those are three ways to be enemies of God. Perhaps he more received from Mephibosheth in the second example. He was still, though, an enemy of David because he was still of that household of, of, uh, of, of Saul. In some ways, you could say this was an inherited enemy. Uh, we had it as an inherited enemy. You know, that those who are one, of one household, two warring households. That house, the, the household hates the other household, and they, the, never the two shall come together except in battle. You've got the classic story of Romeo and Juliet. Even though there was this great love between the two of them, now they can't be together because the households are enemies. But David instead shows the great loving kindness. Rather than saying, he's of the household of Saul, I'm going to treat him as an enemy, I'm going to show him great loving kindness instead. Have we viewed ourselves as God en God's enemies? Has we viewed ourselves as those who are indeed separated from him? Perhaps not in aggression, perhaps more in apathy, or perhaps we have invalidated ourselves because we think that we are Christians, when in fact we're not. We think we are saved because of the things that we do. Well, let's not think of that anymore. Let's instead say, God's calling to me to give up all of my sin and to come to him. Well, then we come to the second thing. It's deformity. Mephibosheth was lame in his feet. Mephibosheth was lame in his feet. He had this blemish. Oh, and you can't have the blemish at the king's table, as I've already mentioned. What a 
sad state that he was in. He was considered an enemy of God, and there he was in Lodabar, sure being cared for by, um, uh, by Machir, the son of Amiel. And yet, he's got this, this, this lameness in his feet. And he's really just going to only be able to pull himself along rather than properly walk from A to B. What about our spiritual deformity? What about our sin? We need to correctly view ourselves and say, those things that perhaps I enjoy, those pleasures of this world, they, don't, they only last for a time and they're going to separate me from God for eternity and they're like the lameness of Mephibosheth's feet. Bunched up, crumpled up, not how it should be. And because it is lameness in the feet, it also means that, we are, that Mephibosheth was unable to make his own way to David. David needed to provide the chariots for him. In our spiritual lameness, we're unable to make our way to God. God has to draw us to himself. He has to call us to himself and give us the various graces that we need to come to himself. Well, thirdly, we're going to go through some, most of these quite quickly. But thirdly, we are separated from God as Mephibosheth was separated from David. Mephibosheth was on the other side of the Jordan. You could say that he was outside of Israel. He was outside of the promised land. He was outside of the kingdom in many ways. He's not naturally, therefore, a, a, a citizen anymore. He's kind of become a citizen of somewhere else. David's fall made us separated. Uh, uh, Adam's fall made us separated from God. Every single one of us, without exception. We are not naturally citizens of his kingdom. We're not naturally citizens of heaven. We're not naturally going to inherit heaven at all. And that's because of our sins. And because of the sin that we inherit from Adam. And our own sins, which cause us to be enemies against him. We rather have a different ruler. A different ruler. Many people think themselves free. Do you think yourselves free to do what you like? You're not under the kingship of God. Mephibosheth, he wasn't under the kingship of David, you could say. Well, are you not under the kingship of God? What, what kingship are you under then? Yourself? Certainly not, because we should try then to live a full day without sinning at all. Try and live a full day without hating somebody or thinking lustfully or... Uh, thinking hateful thoughts or uh, being mean to another or uh, doing anything that would be contrary to God's word without, take, without swearing or blaspheming that's taking God's name in vain without lying without um, being covetous wanting something somebody else has and not being content with your own things see that that's truly what rules us. That's truly what is the master until we are brought by God into his kingdom. We need repatriation, as it were. We need to become citizens of God's kingdom. And God invites us. He said, come and be part of my kingdom. Come and, come and uh, sit under, under me. Come and have me as your great ruler. And there's no ruler better to have than God. One who loves us and cares for us and provides for us. One whom has so set his love upon us that Jesus Christ came into the world to die for us, who would be his own. But perhaps you're fearful at the moment. Oh, I don't know how God is going to receive me. I don't know how God is going to treat me. You know, you've said that I'm an enemy. Well then surely, how can God show me indeed such great loving kindness? Uh, rather, wouldn't it be a case that Mephibosheth would think, I'm being called to my execution? And every step that he takes towards um, David, he's going, what's going to happen to me when I get to Jerusalem? What am I actually heading to Jerusalem for? Is this my execution? Well, many people seem to think that God is against them. 
We want to come back to that in a bit. Uh, fourthly, he was living in Lodabar, which means no pasture. It's interesting, it should be called Lodabar, no pasture. It was, um, it was fine, I suppose, in, the play, in regards to the way that it could be looked for, but it could be, you could be looked after there. But it was really not as good as Jerusalem, not as good as the promised land. Well, in fact, the world is our no pasture. We might think of oh, there's riches, there's blessings in the world. There's, there's all the entertainment. There's all of the, the, uh, the friends I could have. There's all of the, the, the riches I might be able to enjoy. Well, that's not going to bring everlasting joy and comfort and peace. These things are really no pasture to us at all. This world is no pasture. It only leads to destruction if we stay in it. Now let's make, rather than making the world our portion and heading after things of the world and chasing after things of the world, let us instead chase after God as our portion. Put him first in our life. Make him the most important thing. Set him as ruler and also our most beloved. Fifthly, we are being drawn he was drawn then, we said that he was, he, we say he was an enemy, he was deformed, he was separated, that he was in, in low bar, no pasture, separated from David with this deformity of his feet. He had to be drawn by David, he had to have the transport that David provided. And God must draw us to himself. David sent his entourage and God sends his messengers. Here is his messengers. Be reconciled to God. Experience God's amazing grace. David said, come to me, Mephibosheth, and I will show you amazing grace. I'll show you great kindness. I will, se- I will restore to you the land of your uh, grandfather Saul. I will um, bring you so you can come and sit in- at my table continually. I'm going to show you great loving kindness. And God says, your enemies of me, But I'm calling you, I've provided for you a saviour, will you trust him? Will you believe in him? Will you have him as your saviour? Will you say, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, naked come to thee for uh, great dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me saviour, or I die. This amazing grace that God shows to us. That he invites us into his presence. He invites us to be reconciled to him. You are an enemy of God and yet God says, you can be reconciled to me again. You can be my friend once again. You can have me as your saviour. You can have me as your Lord. You can have me as the one who is going to look after you and care for you. All you've got to do is trust me. Christ has done it all for you on the cross. He's already won all of the blessings for you. And we want to, we'll look at those blessings a little bit more in detail as we go on. We'll be too often we'll try and rely on ourselves. Ephesians 2, uh, 9 says, Salvation is not of works, lest anyone should boast. We, we can't do anything to save ourselves. So we must rely fully upon God. We've already said, nothing in my hand I bring. There was David's expense, everything at David's expense to bring Mephibosheth to himself and everything at God's expense to bring us to himself. God sent his son to be the saviour of the world, to be your saviour. Will you trust him? It was all at his expense. This was the the expense of the, the joys of heaven, the expense of the riches of heaven, the expense of peace of heaven, the expense of his own life is what Christ went through so that we could be brought to the Father, reconciled to God. Yes, Jesus Christ gave all so that he could win all his own to himself and rid them of all their sin and have them all reconciled to the Father. Well, Mephibosheth had to trust that message. Mephibosheth had to believe that when David said, I intend you kindness, he actually intended kindness. 
He had to believe that when David said, I'm going to restore the land to you, David was going to restore the land to him. I'm going to give you servants. He would actually give him servants. When he said, um, you can sit at my table continually, that he really could sit at David's table continually. Mephibosheth had to trust the message and get on that transport. Even though he wasn't 100% certain when he set that journey off, what David really intended when he got to Jerusalem. He could look at the kings around and go, the king of the Philistines would kill me. The king of the Syrians would kill me. The king uh, of the Amorites or the, uh, would kill me. All of the kings around about would kill me. Is David really going to be any different? What about us? I already said, you know, some dare not approach God. Are we going to approach God? Some dare not approach God. They hear about us being enemies and they hear about... Uh, they, hear, they, they hear about the, the fact that God is holy and they go, well, that that's, counts me out then. I don't approach God at all, so I'm just going to have to go on as I am at the moment. Well, that's a distortion of God's holiness. It's a distortion of the attributes of God. They, they forget God's loving kindness, his great compassion for the lost. They forget that there is indeed that one who has died for them. Christ, the mediator, the one who can, although, yes, they are enemies of God, although they are separated from God, can bring them back into God's presence, can make themselves, make them friends with God again, can make them reconciled to God, can Christ, the mediator, this one whom has given himself for us and then brings us to the Father. If even Saul of Tarsus could receive the grace of God, and while on the road to Damascus, be called by God, and if even Manasseh, the king of Judah, could while in exile, captured by the enemy, this king who had, by the way, sacrificed children to his gods, if even he could, if even both of them could receive the grace of God and be, be saved, then surely each one of us can be as well. We just need to solely trust in that Saviour, the one who reconciles us. And it's foolish not to go. Thibosheff did wisely. He said, well, I've heard about this David. Yes, he's, he's a king. And the other kings around about me would treat me in this way. Yeah, he loved my father. And David, he shows great kindness and compassion to his, ser to his servants and to those in his kingdom. Although I'm not 100% certain, I'm going to go. He acted wisely. Are you going to act wisely? and go to God alone for salvation, go through Jesus Christ alone as a saviour, or are you going to act foolishly and say, actually, I don't want to go, or I'm not sure God really could accept me, or actually, I don't really need it. We, don't, we should not ignore that invitation to come as a sinner to God. And we should come with care. God is holy. When Moses approached the burning bush, God said, take the sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. When God came down on Mount Sinai and gave the Ten Commandments, the whole of the Israelites trembled because God was so holy. When Isaiah was in the temple and the presence of God appeared to him, he said, woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips. That's the prophet of God saying that. So we must be careful in the way that we come to God. But we must come to God. And we see this in Mephibosheth's response. He came with, came with great humility. We must humble ourselves before God, as Mephibosheth did before David. James uh, chapter 4 and verse 10 says, James chapter 4 verse 10, 
Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Now we'll come to the exaltation, the lifting up in a minute. But before that, let's consider this humiliation, the humbling of oneself. Mephibosheth fell before David. He said, I'm submissive. My, my life is in your hands. If you do mean me harm, look, I'm prone. You'll slay me here and now. But I'm trusting you. I'm putting my life in your hands. Well, David showed great kindness, didn't he? David was the unrivaled ruler at the time. But God is the best ruler to have. David showed all of this amazing kindness. But God's amazing kindness is far superior than David's amazing kindness. So you entrust your soul to God. Uh, Another passage in 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 19. Therefore, uh, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in in doing good as to a faithful creator. That's, of course, speaking about it being in suffering. There is perhaps suffering as a believer, But even then, we can be blessed. Job is a prime example. So there is the submission of one's whole life to God. Mephibosheth laying prone on the floor. My life is in your hands. We say, come before God. Put your life in his hands. Say, my life is in your hands. Do with me what you will. You are the saviour, save me. I need your saving power. I need your salvation, Lord. When Mephibosheth put himself on the floor before David, he heard David say something. And it wasn't just what David said, it would have been the way that David said it. David said, Mephibosheth, David said his name, Mephibosheth. This was uh, when the intonation of his voice would have expressed great kindness and care for this individual. He heard David's gracious and loving call, and so he responded, Here I am, here is your servant. Yes, this is me. I'm Mephibosheth. I I am your servant. Interesting, another sort to return to one they had wronged as a servant. We'll uh, consider that in a minute. If God calls you by name, as he does, in the fact that you're hearing a message, will you resist Will you act foolishly? Why then will you act foolishly and and die? As Ezekiel 33, 11 says. Now we don't consider ourselves more highly than Mephibosheth should consider himself. Mephibosheth was willing to humble himself before David. We should be willing to humble ourselves before God. Well, we'll have to speed on a bit. Eighth, after this, Mephibosheth had the blessings restored and more besides. The forfeited land is given back to him. The Garden of Eden is given back to us. Well, it's not exactly the Garden of Eden. It's the heavenly, the far greater garden. We have many other blessings. Uh, Communion with God is restored. David had communion with David. Uh, Mephibosheth had communion with David, restored. He now had peace with the king, and we can have peace with God as our king. uh, Mephibosheth had joy in David's presence, and we can have joy from God and in God. So there's three things already. Communion restored, peace with the king, and joy in his presence. David was very precious to Mephibosheth. It's God very precious to us. And as Mephibosheth got to know David, and as he saw David put into practice what he said he would do, the restoration of the land, and many other things beside, he became more assured. Yes, David really does truly care for me and keep me. Well, God is a better carer than even David was to Mephibosheth. 
And other things is the forgiveness of sins. Will you remain outside of the kingdom, an enemy of God, and in your sins, when instead you could have the forgiveness of your sins? And one of the blessings that Mephibosheth received from David's hand was adoption, as it were. He shall be like one of the king's sons. He shall sit at my table continually. Oh, he who was an outcast and could be considered an enemy of God, or an enemy of David rather, now is brought into his presence continually and sat at his table constantly. The outcast is called and adopted. God seeks the outcast and makes them his own children. God seeks the one who is at enmity against him and makes him a child. Although we may be a long way off in a barren land, low de bar, no pasture, he comes, he comes to us and to call us as his children. And this is why we read the parable of the prodigal son. The prodigal was a long way off. And while still a long way off, his father sees him and runs to him and embraces him. And the son says, I, I want to return as a servant. And the father will have none of it. Bring out the fatted calf. Put a ring on his finger. Put the best robe on him. This, my son, was lost and is found. This one who was separated from me is now reunited to me. This one who treated me with such great contempt, whom could, you could say was almost like an enemy to me, is now reconciled to me. He rejoices at the return of his son. Well, God is greater. He rejoices at our return to him. He is out calling us and seeking us and trying to draw us to himself. He is out sending this message so that you will hear, be reconciled to God. Why will you perish in your sins? Why will you be separated from God for eternity when he invites you, come into his presence, sit at his table continually, now and forever? God gave his son for you so that it could be so. Salvation is all from him. If we remain in our sin, we perish. If we don't want to be reconciled, if we say no, then we will not be. And we will miss out on all of the blessings, and including the greatest blessing of all, Christ is ours. And we are his. And this is continually... Mephibosheth was continually in Jerusalem and we can be continually before God. Mephibosheth was always near David and we can always be before and near God. We have that invitation to dwell in his presence forever. At Psalm 23, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So Mephibosheth was in a land of no pasture, Lodabar. He was separate from David and considered an enemy. Yet he was called by David out of David's own loving kindness to come to him. He had all the blessings his fathers had lost returned to him and was invited to dwell in David's house for his whole life. We are in a land of no pasture in the world. We are separated from God, who is truly our enemy because we sin. Yet God calls us to himself. He draws us to himself because he shows such immeasurable loving kindness. He restores us into communion with him and restores many other blessings which Adam lost, plus more besides. He calls us sons and daughters, inviting us constantly to dwell before him and to come into his presence one day for eternity in heaven. 
And therefore, I implore you, do not forsake his invitation. Do not ignore his call. Do not delay with this gracious invite being set up before you. Come to God. Turn from your sins. Turn to God. Fall humbly before him, asking for forgiveness, and you will find forgiveness full and free. And a rich blessing it will be to you. And the riches of God will be yours. And God will be yours. And you will be in his presence for eternity. Well, may there be none who ignore that invitation. May we indeed all look to God through Christ for salvation. Amen.